Hello, I'm going to be solving the Electronics WJEC GCSE paper E2 from 2018 today. Um, the link to the paper is in the description below. Be sure to check that out and if you find this useful, please make sure that you tell your friends who are also studying electronics or I also do physics videos as well. Question one, nice easy one to set you off. You have to link these to the applications. So a car indicator flashes on and off repeatedly, needs an A stable. A security light comes on for a short period when it's triggered, that will be a monostable. A light inside the fridge comes on when the door is opened and goes off when it's closed, you'll need a latch for that. And a burglar alarm stays on when it's triggered until a reset switch is pressed, you need a latch for that. Oh, hang on. For each subsystem, draw one line to link it to its correct application. So you definitely need the latch for that one. That one you could do with just an ordinary switch. You don't need a latch for that one. So there's only three lines that you're supposed to draw there. So which one of the following statements about a monostable circuit is true? When triggered, the output changes from a logical zero to a logical one instantly and then stays there for a certain time, then resets automatically. So that's that one then changes back again repeatedly, that would be an A stable, slowly and then stays there. Nope. Uh, and then here we have the circuit diagram for a monostable based on the 555, you need to know this off by heart, so that's the latch, that is, don't know what that is, uh, and we need a resistor and a capacitor going into six and seven, so it's this one here, you just need to know that. Here are four A-stable signals. Now, just check the scales on the graphs. They're all the same. Sometimes they change the scales. Which two signals have the same amplitude? So that would be this one and this one, because they've got the same height there. So that's A and D. Which two signals have the same period? That would be this one and this one, because that one is four boxes, one, two, three, four, and this one is four boxes, one, two, three, four. So that is A and C. An A-stable subsystem has a period of 10 seconds. What's its frequency? Well, frequency is one divided by the period. Sorry, frequency is one divided by the period, which is one over 10, so that's 0.1 hertz. Question 3A, we've got a seven seg display like this. A one turns the light on, I assume, yes. So we just need to work out how to display the letter H. So we'd need B and C, we'd need G, we'd need F and E. And those two, A and D, would be zero. The display is used in a single digit decimal counting system shown in the diagram. Okay, so we've got a counter, decoder, and the seven seg display itself with a common cathode. Which of the following rows in the table produces a seven on the display? So we want A, B, and C to be high. So it's this one here. And what connection must be made to the common cathode pin to make the display work? Circle the correct answer. Well, we'd need Definitely it's connected to zero volts. Ideally you'd connect it through protective resistors or you put protective resistors here But some decoders have the protective resistors built into them So a practical hint there if you use some decoders and you don't put a protective resistor on here and you don't put one here You can damage your LEDs a Temperature controller has two input subsystems a switch unit a Temperature sensing unit a Schmidt inverter and this AND gate here, write down the analog or digital in the box next to the signals listed here in the table. So the output of the temperature sensing unit, that's going to be analog. The output of the switch, that's going to be digital. It's either going to be 12 volts or 0 volts. The output of the Schmidt inverter, that's going to be digital. And the output of this logic gate is going to be digital. So we're going to be digital apart from the temperature sensor there. Question five, here we've got a um, decade counter. 
which this statement best describes the function of the decade counter. It counts up in tens. No, it just counts up one at a time. It resets automatically on the 16th pulse. No, it resets automatically on the 10th. Each output goes high in turn. Yes, it does. Every tenth count the output from the pulse. Every tenth count it outputs a pulse from the clock pin. No, it doesn't. Part B. A diagram shows part of a lighting sequence controlled by a decade counter. Outputs W, X, Y, and Z are, control, are controlling LEDs. The counter resets when the reset pin receives a logical one. So when the output four goes high, it will reset back to zero again. So complete the table by writing on or off for each LED shown in the sequence. I'm gonna put reset here as well. So when it's on the first pulse, so if it starts with that one being high on the first pulse, this one will go on. So this is a zero and that will be zero. On the second pulse, that one will go on and reset will be zero. On the third pulse, that one will go on, reset will be zero. And on the fourth pulse, this will briefly go one, which will reset this back to zero. And if it's at zero, then Z will come on. So that is on again. And in all the other cases, they're off. There we go. So this one comes back on because on pulse four, it resets it back to zero, which turns Z back on again. Which of the following statements best describes the behavior of D-type flip-flop? The Q-bar pin changes state every time a clock pulse trigger gives the flip-flop. No, only if you had done the feedback there to turn it into a ripple counter. The clock is triggered when the D-pin changes state. No, it's the other way around. The Q-pin copies the logic level at D when the flip-flop is triggered, absolutely. And the D-pin copies, no, it doesn't do anything of the sort. A D-type flip-flop is rising edge triggered. On the graph, which arrow indicates a rising edge of a clock pulse? Circle the correct answer. Well, it's that one there, or there, but that's the only one that's labeled. So it's A. A bit more on the D-type. Which connection could be made to make a one-bit counter? To make a one-bit counter, we need to do that. So Q-bar back to D. So it's that one there. Initially, the one bit counter is reset. So that means that Q starts off at zero and Q bar starts off at one. Use the axis provided to draw the corresponding signals for Q and Q bar. So first of all, mark up all the rising edges on your clock. Then if you get a ruler and mark them down in pencil maybe, or a dotted line. And then every time you get to this, you have to change state. So it gets high there, it gets low again there, it gets high at that one, and goes low again there, like so. And Q bar does the opposite. Get low there, high at that rising edge, low at that rising edge, high at that rising edge, etc. A diagram shows a two bit up counter connected to a pulse generator. It is rising edge triggered and initially reset, so they're both at zero there. The top graph shows the pulses received at the pulse generator. Complete this one here. So if you think about a counter, it's going to count like this, B, A, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So every time we get a count, there, 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 and there, we're going to count up to one of those values. So here, we are going to be at 0, 0, so that's 0 and 0. Here we're going to be at 0 and 1, so that's got to be 0 down there. 
Here we're going to be at 1 and 0. So that's 1 and 0. And here we're going to be at, at 1 and a 1. So I shouldn't have gone down there. And then, I guess that, like so. Now that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is realizing that the next stage here is always triggered by the falling edge at A. So you've got a falling edge there, which transitions that. And you've got a falling edge there, which transitions that, like so. But I think this way works quite nicely. So what's the binary number of count T? Well, I already identified that, one zero. So it's that there. A microcontroller is used to operate a lamp in a dark corridor using two push switches, P and Q, located at either ends of the corridor. When switch P or switch Q is pressed for a moment, the light comes on for 10 seconds, complete the following flow chart. So we want to check if either switch is pushed, and if they are, we'll go onto this to turn the light on for 10 seconds. So, uh, we want is switch Q on. Oh, we probably just wanted to write a B there. And then here we want to write a D is switch P on. And then here we want to turn the lamp on. Then we want to wait 10 seconds. Then we want to turn the lamp off again. It's nice and easy. Ace. Comparators and Schmidt inverters can be used to interface a light sensing unit to a logic system. Which statement about the comparator is correct? It has a single switching voltage threshold at 0.7, let's say, transistor, an NPN transistor. It has a single switching threshold at a voltage which can be varied. Yes, that's true for the comparator. It has two switching thresholds. No, that's the Schmidt. It has two switching thresholds which can be varied. Um, that you can make them out of an op amp. You can make a Schmidt trigger out of an op amp that could do that. Which statement gives the advantage of a Schmidt inverter over comparator in this application? It stops contact bounce in the light sensor. Not really. Contact bounce is some, a property of switches, not light sensors. It stops a rapid output switching when the light level fluctuates slightly. So that's the trick there. If you had your light level and it was doing this, so it was wibbling up and down, and that was the threshold of it changing. Then you'd turn the light off, and then on, and then off, then on, then off, then on, and off. So that would be bad. So that's why a Schmidt inverter is good for that situation. Okay, this is the standard block diagram of the mixing desk with your microphones. Uh, which you need to learn. Which of these subsystems converts electrical signal into sound? That's this one, E. It's designed to specifically boost the signal current. That's the power amp. It's designed to specifically boost the voltage. That's that one, B, the preamplifier. Dead easy. Okay, so part B, here we have a summing amplifier. We've got two different input resistors and we've got um, one feedback resistor of 7.5 kilo ohms. Um, and we've got our two inputs there. I'm going to write these onto the diagram. So that's 2.0 volts and that's 1.0 volts. So the equation that you need to know is V out. It's on the formula sheet. Equation is on the formula sheet here, summing amplifier here. So it's equal to minus R feedback times by V1 over R1 plus V2 over R2. So let's put in our values. We've got, it's equal to the minus the feedback, 7.5 times 10 to the three, times by V1, so it doesn't matter which way around you have these. So I'm gonna go for this one as V1, two divided by R1, which is 30 times 10 to the three, plus one divided by this resistor here, 15 times 10 to the 3. Close the bracket there. So all of these times 10 to the 3 is cancel, and we get minus 7.5 times by 2 over 30 plus 1 over 15, which is that one there. Then what we need to do is actually calculate that. So 
2 over 30 times plus 1 over 15. Well, 1 over 15, uh, well, 2 over 30 is 1 over 15, so that's equal to minus 7.5. 1 over 15 plus 1 over 15, so that's equal to minus 7.5 times by 2 over 15, and that and that cancel to give a 2, so that and that cancel to give a 1, so it's equal to minus 1 volt is the final answer. Question 12. A, B and C are different voltage amplifiers. When the input signal has an amplitude of 4 millivolts, amplifier A produces an output signal of that. So its gain has got to be 40 divided by 4 is 10. The circuit diagram for amplifier B is shown below. What is the voltage gain of this one? So this, the gain, is equal to minus RF over R in, because it's the inverting amplifier. You can tell that because the input is connected to the inverting terminal. So it's... Um, Minus 120 divided by 10 is minus 12. So it's that one there. The top graph shows the voltage signal applied to the input of amplifier C. The bottom graph shows the corresponding output. What's the gain of this one? So we're going from 0.1 to 6. So we want 6 divided by 0.1 is equal to 60. And it's positive, this one. So it's 60 there. A block diagram for a sequence controller is shown below. So we've got a pulse generator, a counter, a memory unit, which is slightly off spec these days, and an LED array. We've got three address lines and four data outputs. So what's the minimum number of bits that the counter must have? Well, we need to be able to count all three address lines. So we need three. Each output is connected to a single LED. So how many LEDs are required? So one, two, three, four. All right, part C. Initially the counter is reset, so we're at this line here. How many pulses are needed to produce an output of 0, 1, 0, 0? So 0, 1, 0, 0 is that line there. So we need one pulse to take us to that line, a second pulse to take us to that line. So we need two pulses. Okay, the diagram shows part of a control system for LED lighting sequence. The LED light comes on when it receives a logical one. The behavior of the LEDs X and Y is shown on the table here and here. Right, box one must contain the logic code. So box one is connecting A to X. So here it goes, zero is on, one is off, zero is on, one is off. So it's always the opposite. So that's got to be a not gate. <coughs> box two must contain what logic gate? So box two here is from A and B. So it's these two. I'm just going to rewrite this as one, 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 zero, one, 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 zero, like so. So if you look at that, this pattern repeats itself twice and so does this one. So it's just when both of them are ones, this is a zero. So that is a NAND gate. Which two pulses cause the LED Z to switch off? So A or C. So I'm going to write Z in here, A or C, so that is 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So it's on pulse 0 and pulse 2. The next diagram includes the reset subsystem, so we're resetting off C and B. The counter resets when the reset pin receives a 1. The logic gate in box W makes the counter reset a pulse 6. So it's got to be here. So that is when they're both high, so that's an AND gate. Like so. Right, here we have the Schmidt question. So we need to draw on these two transitions. 
So we want to draw an edit of 9 volts, so we find 9 volts there. And we want to draw it on at 6 volts. So there's 6 volts. Right now, be careful because it's crossing both times, so we need to make sure we get it to go the right way. So the output changes from a 1 to a 0 when the rising input goes above 9. So that's going to be there. So it's going to go from a 1 to a 0. Does it tell us what a 1 is? Yes. 1 logical 10 volts. And then it goes to 0. A signal of 1 volt represents a 0. So I've got to just be careful there. Right, so the, the idea of a Schmidt is that it doesn't change again when you come back below here. You have to go to the bottom threshold here in order for it to change again. So that's when that happens. So at this point here, it will go up to here. And then it never gets higher than 9 volts again, so it stays that way all the way to the end. So that's the answer to that one. So a non-inverting amplifier has a voltage gain of 12. The graph shown has a peak of 0.25. Draw the output. So we've got 0.25 times by 12 is equal to 3 volts. So it's going to peak at 3 volts. It's going to peak there. It's plus. It's a non-inverting, so it goes that way. 0 is going to be there. Minus 0 0.25 goes minus 3 there. That will be 0, 0, plus there, like that. Easiest way to do these is to turn the page around. It's always best to mark on with little x's the values that you're plotting through, because then even if you mess up the curve, it's obvious what you've done. Right, so we've got the non-inverting amplifier here. You can tell x the input connects to the non-inverting input, and it's got negative feedback. So the gain of this is equal to 1 plus Rf over R in, uh, R2, not R in, R2. So that's going to be that one divided by that one. And we need to make it so that it has a voltage gain of 12. So this needs to be equal to 11. So what numbers could we get to make it equal to 11? If we used 110k here, and we used a 10k here, that would give that equal to 11. And then here, um, you just want to connect that with a piece of wire. The input impedance of that is huge, so you don't need anything going there. Question 17. We have the transistor question. Transistor switch is used to interface a logic system to a lamp. It's a very common question. A transistor has a current gain of 50. So that's HFE equals 50. The current through R is 0 0.2 milliamps. What's the current flows through the lamp if it's not saturated? So I'll do the IC. So IC is equal to HFE times by IB, the base current. And that is on your formula sheet here. I've just rearranged it. So we've got that's equal to 50 times by 0.2, which is equal to 10 milliamps. Because that's in milliamps, that comes out as in milliamps. Calculate the voltage across resistor R. So V is equal to I times by R. So the current going through there is 0.2 times 10 to the minus 3, then times by its resistance of 30 times 10 to the 3. So those two cancel. We've got 30 times by 0.2 is 6.0 volts. So that's 6.0 volts. What is the voltage at V1? So we've got to, what is the voltage at V1? We've got to remember to turn the transistor on. This has to be 0 0.7 volts to make that diode drop start to conduct. 
So 0.7 volts there, we've got 6 volts across there, so that is 6.7 volts. 6.7 volts goes there. That's the end of the paper. Well, I hope you find that useful. If you do, please like the video and please tell anybody that you know who's doing electronics where they can find these videos. And that would be very helpful to me. Thank you.